This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. The views expressed by guests on this program do not necessarily represent the views of the host or owners of the Doggy Diva Show and do not necessarily constitute endorsement of products. Medical information discussed by guests on this program are those of the guests and is only for informational purposes and should not replace medical advice by your local veterinarian professional. Hi, this is Susan Marie from the Doggy Diva Show. This week, did you know bread dough can be toxic for your pets? Also, the power of dogs to inspire us. Then, how the environment affects your pets as well as you and celebrating Canine Veterans Day. That's what's on our show this week. Stay with us. Hey, did you hear that? What is that? It's the bark heard round the world. The Doggy Diva Show. Here's Susan Marie. Hi, welcome to the Doggy Diva Show, the show for animal lovers. I'm your host, Susan Marie, and as always, I'm joined by my canine co-hosts, the Doggy Divas themselves, Francesca, Coco, and our newest little diva, Miss Olive. Miss Olive is the cute little Italian greyhound rescue in the picture with the microphone. Thank you for joining us today as we bring the experts in the pet and animal world right to you. So go grab a cup of coffee and your pet's favorite treat, and we'll be back in just a moment. Hey, cat people. Litter box smells always on your mind. Think about your cat, not the box, with World's Best Cat Litter, the litter that delivers big odor control in a tiny package. World's Best Cat Litter harnesses the concentrated power of corn to trap odors deep inside the litter. Ready to knock out smells and use less litter? Find World's Best Cat Litter at Target, Walmart, and in your local grocery and pet stores. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to the Doggy Diva Show. We have Monica Layton, uh, owner of Professional Pet Sitting. Monica, one of the things we've talked about, and we talk about it around the holidays, and we talk about it for different events, for people who do a lot of baking, but there is such a danger in something that could be so much fun or so good for the pet parent, but not so good for the pet. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so according to the Pet Poison Helpline, bread dough toxicity is literally rising, (laughs) a rising, rising hazard for our pets. So I always wanted to make, you know, everybody aware of this because this is one of those toxicities that isn't as heavily marketed as some of the others. Um, You know, a lot of pet owners are aware, you know, you shouldn't feed grapes, you shouldn't feed raisins, you shouldn't feed macadamia nuts, things of that nature. But a lot of people are not familiar about, you know, the homemade bread doughs um, and the effects that it can have. So, You know, bread dough, it's basic, you know, ingredients, water, salts, yeast, flour, um, that produce that, you know, that produce that mass of dough to rise. Um, then you make your bagels, your baguettes, Italian loaves, pizza rolls, you know, doughs and everything. I mean, I, I am a carb girl. I love my carbs. So for me, that is heavenly. However, um, I myself was not aware of how quick and how hazardous that rising dough before it is cooked can actually be to our pets. So yeast, the main, you know, ingredient in the bread making that makes it rise is actually like a single celled fungi. And the problem with this is some of these organisms have alcoholic fermentation. Okay. So with the right conditions, you know, moisture, warmth, they consume the sugars in the dough mixture. So this consumption makes a alcohol and carbon dioxide. So as the carbon dioxide is produced, gas forms and the dough rises. But during this process, the alcohol in the dough dissipates only a small amount. And in raw nature, the dough is extremely toxic to our pets. So if raw dough is ingested by our pets, you can see toxicity within an hour sometimes. The rising of the bread occurs so rapidly of that dough that when it expands, it continues to expand in the warm, wet 
environment of the stomach. So when this happens, the expansion of that material can cause bloat. It can cause um, foreign body obstruction, stomach torsions. Um, it can cause shock. And even in some severe cases, it can cause the stomach to rupture. Um, some of the signs you'll see is the abdomen will start distending. They're painful. Um, they may try to vomit, um, panting, pacing, things of that nature. Um, in addition, that alcohol that is produced within that raw dough can also cause alcohol toxicity in our pets. So some of those symptoms, you know, being lethargy, difficulty walking, they become um, vocalized more. They increase vocalization, um, behavioral changes. They can actually have urinary incontinence, blindness. Um, it can cause hyperglycemia, which is low blood sugar. And low blood sugar can cause severe reactions such as seizure, comatose, major things. Um, and both of these toxicities lies within the bread dough when it's not cooked. So really vital. And as you make bread, it has to sit for a while. You have to wait for it to rise. So the main thing is to find a rising place for your bread that your pet has absolutely no access to. So this has been the main issue, according to the Pet, Pels and Pet Poison Helpline for the cases that have been called in. You can't simply put it on top of the stove and assume that it's too high for your pet to reach. If they want something badly enough, there is a possibility that they can, you know, even the littlest of guys can jump up that high when there's, you know, food enticing them. Um, so always find a place that is totally totally confined from your pets, making sure that when that dough is rising, the pets can have no contact. Now, Monica, is this for dogs and cats or is this just a dog related issue? Most of the studies they've done are with dogs. They haven't had the issue with cats. Doesn't mean they won't, but they're not seeing it. I had dogs that were counter surfers because they were big, but the cats, ooh, and when a dog wants to get up, I've watched that happen too, but <laughs> little dogs, but I didn't know whether the cats, because of course mine always found their way when something yummy was on the counter, I had to make sure it was totally almost people proof because my kitty would be there going, oh, that looks good. So I just didn't know if it was for cat dogs and cats, but I would say in the safe side, keep your cats away from it too. Absolutely. As a precaution, I definitely would. I can't imagine and that it would be safe for them. Um, just because they're not seeing a lot of reported cases of that doesn't mean that that will not be the case for cats as well. Um, but the main thing is if they do get into any undigested, you know, any uncooked dough, um, get them to a veterinarian right away. I mean, you're definitely going to need to be seen. Something's definitely going to need to be done and you want to do it as quickly as possible. Well, as always, this is really important, really important stuff. I thank you very much and have a great week. Thank you so much. Coming up, tales of inspiration and the life-changing power of dogs. Stay tuned. Does your dog itch, scratch, stink, or shed like crazy? Come to Dynavite for help. Order a 90-day supply of Dynavite. Dynavite is nutrition. Pick up two bottles of Lico Chops. Get the third bottle free. New improved Lico Chops with omega-3, omega-6, vitamin E, and now six extra direct-fed microbials. Even better for the digestive tract and immune system. Try Lico Chops. Buy two, get one free. At Dynavite.com. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to the Doggy Diva Show. We are so honored to have with us today a journalist, an animal advocate, and the author of National Geographic's two books that I absolutely adore, uh, Devoted, 38 Extraordinary Tales of Love, Loyalty, and Life with Dogs, and Loyal, 38 Inspiring Tales of Bravery, Heroism, and the Devotion of Dogs. And then there's her latest release. It was just released this week. Love Unleashed, Tales of Inspiration, and the Life-Changing Power of Dogs. Welcome, Rebecca Asher Walsh. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Very good. Welcome back to the show. And of course, you know I'm a big fan of yours, and I love your books. You have this wonderful theme through all of them. It's the, you know, like the pet parent 
animal bo- bonding or in any line of work that the animal is, there's just bonding. It's like this very beautiful theme. So for those listeners that may not be familiar with your work, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Um, I also love how modest you're being, not mentioning that your dog is in this recent <laughs> book you love so much. But we'll get to that in a minute. Um, I, my background is I'm a journalist, I'm a writer, and an editor, um, mostly entertainment. But my side passion is um, dogs and advocacy for homeless dogs and adoption and um, largely working with pit bulls. And when an editor at National Geographic came up with the original project, Devoted, she thought that I would be a good match for that. I had done a couple of other books for National Geographic, and they were familiar with my work and said, since you love dogs, why don't you give this a go? And it just turned into my passion project, finding these animals and talking to these people. And so we've ended up doing a trilogy, and the third book is out this week. And it is so beautiful. I mean, even the, the I got, just got little goosebumps. Uh, just the, the dog on the cover <laughs> and the way it looks is just so, um, it, it's endearing. The, the, the cover is as endearing as the book is just so full of love. Can you tell us what your inspiration was for doing Love Unleashed? Because it's a little different. But as I said, you always have that same theme, that bond, that human animal bond through your, throughout your books, which I love. It's, it tells the story from sort of like the animal's eyes and the human's eyes, which is the gift that you have. But can you tell us a little bit about your inspiration for Love Unleashed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this one was, for me, the most fun to do because after the first two, we'd sort of earned the right to do what we wanted. So the first one devoted was a mix of different animals, different stories. The second one was focused solely on therapy dogs, service dogs, you know, dogs who were of official um, service of some kind. And when this book came along, I said, I really, there are two things that I've really loved the most about the last two books. And one of those is the joyful stories, which doesn't mean they can't be poignant and moving, but not being bound to have to do service dogs or therapy dogs really freed me up in some ways. Um, And also focusing very specifically in most of the cases on rescue dogs, Mm -hmm. because my feeling is there are just as many extraordinary stories about extraordinary dogs who weren't brought from a breeder. So there's no reason not to remind people that just because a dog is in a shelter doesn't mean the dog has done something wrong. It's not something's happened or there's something wrong wrong with with the dog. The dog. Mm -hmm. So I was able to really talk about a lot of dogs who've gone on to be amazing companions to people from shelters and also the dogs who ended up in shelters because maybe they weren't meant to be pets and have gone on to be the most extraordinary arson detecting dog or bomb detecting dog and that every dog has a purpose in our human world and can serve it if given the opportunity well you certainly did i mean there's animals in this book and and some of them were whether they were found literally on the streets and jumped into someone's car or (laughs) (laughs) let's really be in a street dog a very lucky (laughs) one also you know there's there's dogs that were um homeless that got adopted they were became dancing dogs artists environmentalists i mean there's so many that had these hidden talents and when you're in a rescue or shelter situation you you're looking at the animal or you may see it on you know pet finder or whatever and you go oh i really like that dog no one ever knows right what it, what these rescue dogs have inside them. And that's why I love this book so much because you took it and it's like opening up a flower. It like It's like mm-hmm. showing, mm-hmm. yeah, it's like showing what these rescue dogs are about. And of course, my entire uh, life and my show is predominantly about rescue because right. I have rescue dogs and I am so honored that you featured my little olive in your Aww, book. Mm-hmm. That was such a delight. So, I mean, I just want to tell people who are listening how this happened because you interviewed me for Loyal, and we started talking, I think after, we talked a little bit during the show about Olive, and then we started talking afterwards, and I said, but this is exactly the kind of story I'm doing in the book I'm writing now. Um, and you and Olive really are the perfect example of two creatures who came along and rescued each other. And when you were talking about 
nobody knowing what these dogs are or can do potentially. I think so much of what's so beautiful about when people rescue an animal is that they begin to open themselves up to this animal in ways that perhaps they were closed before or anxious before or, or somehow broken themselves and that by opening up to these animals, they change our lives because we change who we are. And I think you and Oliver are a wonderful example of that. And inject humor into our lives, speaking of Oliver. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful to get a a sense of childish delight back through our dog. Yeah, she's a very whimsical, but she's very serious at the, you know, like she knows with me, she could be, she's, she, she kids around. She's great with children, great with people. We take her all kinds of social events. She comes everywhere with me. Also, what people, what I have talked about it openly on the show, but for people who may not be familiar who are listening, I was in a very bad, serious car accident, and I went through numerous surgeries, and I was at home. I couldn't drive. I had to be driven to physical therapy. I was in physical therapy for quite a few years, and because I was home and could take care of this dog that just had her leg amputated through um, an abuse, a rescue due to abuse, and had all her teeth taken out, and she was very sick. She had cancer. Um, They needed someone who was home, so... It like benefited me. I'm going, oh gosh, I could probably help her so much because I'm home. I can't do anything. Well, what she did is she really helped me because as you said in the book, I couldn't drive. I mean, there was a lot of things that were wrong and she helped to get me out because I had to take her for her therapy. I would take her with me for my therapy. So I started to get out and about again. And it sort of was like, I talk about that flower that blossomed. She saved my life. She helped yeah. me to get reintegrate back into uh, the world again in a way not looking at myself with some of my yeah. limitations from the accident because I look at her and I said, dear Lord, she's got three legs, no teeth, and she looks at the world now so happy um, and she changes, she changes a lot of people's lives as in your book, these dogs, you could see where they change not only their pet parent's life but other people people mm-hmm. around them i mean the, it's 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 true what you say the life-changing power of dogs i'm living proof so yeah yeah so i yeah, thank you also, again I mean, and beyond and just quickly beyond that the dogs change other people's lives you know when the dogs change us mm-hmm. that also changes the world around us because we're better people absolutely we're kinder people mm-hmm. we're more generous people we're more compassionate so it really is good for the world to go rescue a dog uh, that's speaking of that. You have a wonderful foundation, the Deja Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. Um, so I am a volunteer at our New York City shelter, which is a high kill shelter, and it's obviously a very complicated volunteer job. And a couple of other people and I became very frustrated that the two options too often seem to be that the dogs are either being euthanized or they're being pulled by rescues that are very, very overburdened because obviously they want to save every dog's life, but mm-hmm. there aren't enough homes. And the dogs, as you know, we were talking about, you don't really know the dog, so they come out and they develop behavioral issues. And one of the things that we also saw was that when the dogs go into adoptive homes, and as you and I know from doing rescue and adoption work from dogs directly from shelters, you know, they're pretty traumatized. Mm-hmm. Um, so the dog isn't housebroken or isn't leash trained or the dog's gotten kennel cough or the dog's gotten pneumonia. And these can be really difficult things for both rescues, which are financially strapped, but also for an adoptive parent who's gone in perhaps with an open heart and is suddenly dealing with a dog with acute separation anxiety and the neighbor's calling the cops while they're at work. You know, it, it can be, it can get in the way of the bonding immediately. So what we decided to do is we started Deja Foundation, and what we do is we subsidize or provide scholarships for dogs rescued off a youth list that go towards their vet bills and towards their training bills. And the idea is to really promote sustainable adoptions and to let the people who are rescuing these dogs know that they're not alone, that they're not just leaving the shelter and then going off on their own and suddenly they're in over their heads and don't know what to do. And you know, the dog has cancer and they have these huge bills or the dog actually does need to be leash trained or goes after skateboards or something like that. So it's been really, really wonderful because 
a lot of times people just need that emotional support to be able to reach out and say, I'm scared by these bills or "Do you, can you recommend a trainer? And you know, they'll call a week later and they're in love with their dog because they're not also sitting there very stressed about doing this alone. Just to know that there's that support there that it is sometimes when you adopt a dog who, who does have you know, whether it be behavioral um, needs or health needs, it can be a little overwhelming. And to know that there's yeah. a support, that's so uh, that's so great what it is that you do. Oh, thank you. Mm-hmm. It's an honor to be able to do it. Yeah, it's 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 wonderful. And I, be- and I truly believe in the last time you and I were talking, we talked about, you know, I said I believe that because of what you do, you're you're so passionate about what you do. It comes through in your books. So all of oh, that, yeah, you. the passion that you have for the rescues and for animals in general. Um, this book is a little more specifically about rescues, but well, whereas the others have been about like service animals and you know d- different animals who are who bond with their owner or who literally are their owner's eyes. Or I mean, I remember uh, the talking to you about some of the stories about some of the children who depended on the dogs that were therapy dogs in your last book. I mean, it was just so special because I know how that that type of a story impacts people, but it does it does it in a positive way. So I know for us to be a part of this, we're we're literally so honored. We are. We're so happy to be a part of it. We're happy to be a part of the word to get that out there, the life-changing power of dogs. As I sit next to her and she's just like asleep in the bed in a chair next to me, like opening up an eye every now and then going, Mom, watching you. <laughs> oh, keeping an eye on <laughs> Keeping you. an eye on Very me. <laughs> so did... Do you have any like favorite stories or things that that you have from um, Love Unleashed that you that you could think of? Any stories that like really stand out? I mean, I it's like asking you know your favorite children because yeah. it's difficult. I think that what really stands out to my favorite part of the book, which isn't quite what you asked, but is that you're talking to all sorts of different people. You know, you're talking mm-hmm. to the head of a zoo. You're talking to a scientist for Disney who does turtle conservation. You're talking to the mother of a little girl whose life has been changed. Mm -hmm. And every single one of them, no matter their personality, no matter their background, no matter the reason for this dog, can't wait to talk about their dog. And it's the sweetest, sweetest, sweetest thing because, you know, when you think about life, when you go through life and it can be socially difficult and people are shy and uncomfortable and sometimes life can seem like a cocktail party without any alcohol, you know, and Mm -hmm. suddenly doing this book, everybody wants to talk and everybody wants to tell their story. And what they're really doing is telling the story of the dog. They think what they're really doing is telling their own story. Mm -hmm. And it's just such an honor to bear witness to people's lives and people's stories and people's hardships and people's triumphs. And they'll tell you everything in honor of the dog. It's really interesting because I asked you that question last time you were on and you pretty much answered me the same way. It's mm. it's like these are all personal, like they become a part of you and it's really hard for you yeah. to, to pick that. And I'm sure the people looking at it go, oh, wow, I wonder if that, but you know, as you read through each one of them and I, I, I kind of like touched on a few, I mean, there's a dog that is, that paints and his paintings are donated, you know, the <laughs> money they make are, I mean, it's amazing. And he was just like a regular rest dog and another yeah. one that dances and is just like a little YouTube sensation and then you have you know people who are environmentalists and and you have them from all over the world it's not just you have them from yeah. the United States this is like an international book and it's like an international book of just love and uh, it, it just shows that in the world right now I think that the world needs that like a connection that love like mm-hmm. a connection and and what you did in this book is you helped to show that no matter where people live or no matter where they are, everyone feels how the person in the United Kingdom feels is the same way that Mm -hmm. I feel about my dog. It's in my dog feels about me. You know, that's the essence. And I would also, I would so advocate anybody who's sort of on the fence about rescuing. I think it's in this book and I think anybody knows this. There's a dog for everybody. Mm -hmm. So for you, it's an olive. Mm -hmm. And for this really, really tough vet who's in the book, who's a recovering addict um, and just a macho, macho guy, 
it's a giant, giant beast who'd had his tongue cut out um, by some abusive person, and he had to come along, and they rescued each other. So there's no one through line of, oh, it has to be a pit bull, or oh, it has to be a chihuahua, or it has to be healthy or not healthy. I mean, they're really our partners, our animal partners are out there, and they're just waiting for us. And it's interesting that you bring that up because a lot of the dogs that are in this book are not healthy, are ha mm -hmm. like all of special needs. But I mean, there are other animals in there that have their own special needs and their true gift shown through. And that's what you wrote about your, your you know, your words showed that no matter what the animal looks like or what their limitations are, physical limitations, their emotional love is what makes it. It, it, that's what makes it happen. And and that's what rescue to me is all about. I mean, I yeah. have, you know, a house full of rescue animals and I, I just love them. I just love them to bits. And I'm not saying that if you don't, that's fine. But I always say, give a rescue a chance. I love that. Good mm -hmm. for you. Thank you. Yeah. So for those people who want to learn more about you, who want to learn more about the Deja Foundation, who want to learn more about all these fabulous books that you have and the latest, Love Unleashed, where can they go? They can Google me. I have a very, very minimal website, but it will allow them to contact me. It's RebeccaAsherWalsh.com. But it, again, it will come up in Google. Um, and they can certainly go to Amazon, which has all the information there as well. Just so that the listeners know, Rebecca's book, Love Unleashed, is being featured in Suncoast Pet Magazine in the new and noseworthy section, which is where uh, a lot of the new great products go. So I think the magazine's online right now. And you can go to uh, Suncoast petmagazine.com and you will find the feature on Love Unleashed and as always I have to thank you, I have to thank you for being our guest, I have to thank you for all that you're doing with the animals and I thank you for getting mine and Olive's story out there Aww. in such a beautiful way My thanks are all to you Thank you, thank you for having me Ah, Our pleasure, we'll be back in just a moment Hi Doggy Diva Show listeners, Susan Marie here to take just a half a minute to let you know how much we appreciate your being with us every week to hear great dog tips you can use with your pet, some great stories about rescues, fostering, and some heartwarming stories about second chances for pets who are now in loving forever homes. Be sure to go to our website, thedoggydiva.com, to see pictures of Miss Olive and other dogs we talk about on the show and get to know us a little better. That's thedoggydiva.com, D-O-G-G-Y. We appreciate your feedback, too. Okay, let's get back to the show. Coming up, a better way for you and your pets to enjoy your outdoor surroundings. Stay tuned. Molly, here's your dinner. <coughs> Zeus, that's not your food. Don't let that happen to your precious cat. Elevate your cat's eating experience with the Cat Tree Tray. The Cat Tree Tray keeps your cat's food off the floor and conveniently located on the cat tree. It's the perfect way to eat. It's a beautiful wrought iron tray that easily attaches to your cat tree and keeps dogs and other critters out of your cat's dish. A must for multi-pet households. There's a 6-inch tray for large bowls and a 4-inch tray for smaller bowls. Purchase your Cat Tree Tray today. Go right now to CatTreeTray.com. That's CatTreeTray.com. C-A-T-T-R-E-E-T-R-A-Y.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back, everyone, to the Doggy Diva Show. Next, we welcome a true canine superhero and his pet parent, Chris Kaiser, who are saving the planet one yard at a time. Welcome, Chris. How are you? Thank you, Susan. It's good to be with you. Good to be with you, too. For the listeners who obviously want to learn more about this because you're very lucky to have an environmental superhero living with you, can you tell us about yourself and what you do? Sure. I run a trade association up in uh, Washington, D.C., um, equipment manufacturers um, and the folks that do business with them. And we have an education foundation 
um, was designed to teach folks about the outdoors and how to responsibly maintain the outdoors and to, frankly, have better practices. Remember, nature starts at your back door. So what can we tell homeowners to do in their own backyard to help nature, it's urban habitat. So that's what the foundation does. So I run both a trade association and its respective education foundation. Your partner there, uh, Lucky, also known as Lucky the Turf Mop, was recently recognized and honored in a book, Love Unleashed, Tales of Inspiration and the Life-Changing Power of Dogs. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, and congratulations to you. I know we share Thank space you. in the same yes, book. We We've got... We've got, uh, both of us have our own heroes. Yeah, he's a street rescue, um, and like so many of the stories in the book, you know, he came into my life at a time where, frankly, I needed him as much as he needed me, mm-hmm. um, and he provided me just the enormous security and benefit, um, and then I came back to Washington, I was out in the Midwest, and I uh, got the job that I currently have, and as we looked at how to connect with kids. How can we connect to kids to teach them the kinds of messages we want to teach them about the outdoors, responsible sustainability, responsible management, that they, in fact, can teach their parents? How, but who knows your yard best? And from my perspective, that was the dog. I watch him in my yard all the time. And I said, he knows every square inch of this yard. He knows where the squirrels come and the deer come and the fox come. <laughs> and so I said, he's the guy to tell it. And so he became, we cartoonized him, and he became a superhero to deal with some bad guys that best illustrate some of the challenges you see in the landscape. And it started out very modestly with a handful of schools, um, with Weekly Reader, and as that of last count, it's been used by 68 million kids. Wow. Their families. Wow. That gave me goosebumps. It, it's worked. And he is a true superhero because he even has a cape. He has a cape and he has an outfit, and because, it's funny because he is a cartoon, but like Spider Man, Peter Parker, right? There's a character behind the superhero, Clark Kent, character behind the Superman. Well, in this case, Turf Mutt, who is the superhero that does battle with bad guys, is actually a real character, a real dog behind that. And that's the backstory, his rescue story. Um, that he paused forward, right? He's champion. He's using his celebrity to basically say every dog can be a turf mutt. Every homeowner or anybody who has a dog can have a turf mutt who can be a superhero to do the right things for the environment. So he has become a real cartoon hero. He's on television. He goes to schools. Our foundation awards money to schools. During the Turf Mud Contest, we give them outdoor classrooms, outdoor learning space. And so he makes a lot of trips to a lot of schools. And I tell you, you walk into a school, a grade school, with a dog with a cape, um, it's an attention getter. <laughs> I think I would have liked that when I was in school. Now, th- this incredible work he does with the children, I mean, he's, and I guess this is where we go back to the rescue side of it, too, because inside so many rescue dogs, there's a hero sitting there waiting to come out. Now, your rescue of Lucky was a bit unique. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I was involved in a political campaign. and It was a bitterly cold day in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I was very near downtown, heading to an office, driving in a very large highway, um, a big road that runs adjacent to the highway, um, four lanes across, and it was dark. Um, and I was driving almost downtown, right at the interstate, and he, this little dog literally shot in front of the car. <laughs> um, and he just was running for his life. Uh, he, he ran down the middle lane of a three-lane road, all one way. Mm-hmm. And I pulled the car in behind him, because I didn't want him to get hit. They were, you know, fairly busy yeah. street. And he ran into an intersection, and I think he ran into a car. He didn't get hit, but I think he bounced into a car. So I pulled the car into the intersection against the light, because he was going to get hit. And um, got right beside him, opened the car door, and I said, you know, come here. And he stood up. Um, he's banged up pretty good. I mean, he'd been on the street a bit. Um, and I picked him up and put him in the car, and the rest is history. I know. What when a I drove wonderful out to the, story, though. True story. We drove him out to the vet, and um, he did not have a chip, and we put some local signs up. But he'd been on the street for a bit. The vet said he was in pretty tough shape. Mm. Um, he was under malnourished and... Um, dehydrated, 
and he'd been banged up. And so, uh, yeah, we both started out together at that moment. I'm a firm believer, Chris, that there are no mistakes in life, and you two are meant to be together. You both found each other, and um, kind of like Olive and I, it's like something that you can't explain. Literally, he went from the streets right into your life from the car. I mean, he literally picked you. So that's just so wonderful. And he's a terrific dog. And what you guys are doing for the environment is wonderful, too. One of the things we talked about is, you know, getting our yard ready and having it safe, environmentally safe. And, you know, my listeners are pet parents. Can you give us some tips on having a great yard that I know that this is something that you and Lucky talk about all the time. Could you have some tips for us for, cause we're getting ready for spring to get your yard in shape? Sure. One of the things that one of the core critical things to know is where do you live? <laughs> Which is really important. This is a big complex country, lots of climactic zones. And so where you live in Florida is very different from where I live in the mid Atlantic, which is very different from where we do the TV show out in California. So it's a big complex country. What's right for you might not be right for the next place. There are some places that are water balanced. And we have to use water wisely. That's one of the turf much key messages. So the key is to know where know your zone. What what's your climactic zone? So you're choosing the right plants for where you live. That way you don't need supplemental water or fertilizers or pesticides. You don't need any of that. Um, and so you can find the right... The thing about dogs, and I've had a lot of dogs over you know, throughout my life, they can be tough on outdoor space. The nice thing about outdoor space is it's a good, safe space for the kids, the family, the dogs. And so turf grass is particularly good, but you want to get the right kind of turf grass. And there's some, there's good, there's tough kinds, and again, there's climatic appropriate drought resistant, et cetera, and there are certain kinds of turf that are better for dogs. So there alone, just the grass, which is sort of pretty tough stuff, you can choose the right one for where you live. One of the things we also encourage homeowners to do is include flowering plants. It can be a bush, you know, a butterfly bush. So many of us live in migrating areas where insects and birds are just passing by overhead, and they look down. Even in the big city, they'll see green, and that's urban habitat. If we just do a little bit, we can help those folks, those birds and bees, when they need to rest and recharge by feeding them, and that can be as simple as a flowering plant that's unique to your region that also is pollinator support. Bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, even bats. Without pollinators, we don't eat. So we need to support pollinators, and so every homeowner can do that by just including a handful of flowering plants. So those are the kinds of key messages um, Turf Mud has for homeowners. The other thing about landscape, as you come into spring, know what you want to do. Try to plan that out. If you're going to use a landscaper, sometimes they'll get busy in the spring. You kind of have to get a sense of what you want. If you've got equipment, again, I represent companies that make outdoor equipment. You have to make sure it's uh, in good shape to run. You want it to keep like emergency equipment, chainsaws, generators. For those of us who've had experience in Florida, you want that stuff to work when you need it. Mm -hmm. And so you have to plan for that. You have to know the fuel, know your right fuels. So those are some of the things you can do to get ready for the spring. I think that the, those are wonderful tips. I really like the one, too, about the pollinator. I had no idea. You know, we, we all plant you know, flowers and you, you try to plant things that are appealing visually, but to know that you could plant something or, you know, have something in your yard that does so much more than just look beautiful. It actually has a purpose. Absolutely. We just did a school in Clearwater, Florida, um, that won that one of the turf mud contests. We gave them an outdoor classroom. And so many of the students had, had never held a plant. They'd never dug a hole. They'd never been in the dirt. And it's a great teaching exercise. And so we gave them a flowering garden. And literally, on the first day, after we have cut the ribbon, if you will, butterflies and bees were in the space. Oh, and so cool. there was an on-site ab testament to the power. And they're like, holy cow, we, you talked about this. I said, yes. And these honeybees... These are pollinators. They're going to go back and they're going to pollinate other flowers and foodstuffs. So we put in some butterfly bushes, and lo and behold, a bunch of butterflies showed up, as did hummingbirds. Nature is so much smarter than we know or we give it credit for. Uh, all you have to do is plant it, and they will come. 
Use a living landscape. Plant real plants. Don't use plastic grass and plastic plants. Plant something that's alive. And you don't have to have a yard. You have a balcony or an apartment or a condominium or a roof. A pot will do it. Put a flowering plant in the pot on your patio, and you'll be amazed at what shows up. Wow, that's such that's such great information. So, uh, for the listeners who want to learn more about you, learn more about Lucky and all of the good work you do, and and all of this information that you're giving us, where can they go? A couple of different spots. The superhero, of course, has his own website. <laughs> um, he's way more famous than I am. I just get to drive him around. He does a lot of travel. That sounds familiar. <laughs> he's at turfmutt dot com. T u r f m u t t dot com. That's a site, a site we share with Scholastic. That's our education partner that puts this curriculum into the schools. There's also livinglandscapesmatter.com, which talks about the need for living landscapes and knowing your zone. Those are the two best places. And if you want to learn about power equipment, uh, opei.org. That's the Outdoor Power Equipment Institute. And that's the organization that I run. And so there's a bunch of equipment manufacturers. So if you want to learn about machines, that's the place. If you want to learn about turf mutt, turfmutt.com, and livinglandscapesmatter.com. Well, and it's also important because it all works together. It all comes together, and that's why it's so important that uh, that the listeners can go and find out what they need in all of those sites. So, And I thank you. For you being a guest on our show today, I I personally learned a lot, and I congratulate you and Lucky for being featured in Love Unleashed: Tales of Inspiration and the Life Changing Power of Dogs by Rebecca Asher Walsh, which is available on at Amazon and other book locations. But it's a really wonderful book, and if you want to learn more about Lucky and the incredible work that he does, I mean, he certainly is. I know why he's named Lucky. <laughs> He's really <laughs> lucky. He is. And he's very, very special and very photogenic, by the way. He is a handsome beast. He and that is. goes to show you that these that a that a hard scrabble street dog or a shelter dog can make fantastic, wonderful pets. They teach us about humanity and redemption. And they you you serve the life if you've adopted a dog and they know it. So I encourage your encourage your listeners to get out there and adopt their next best friend. Oh, I couldn't have said it better. Well, thank you for being our guest. Thank you and Lucky for all of the wonderful work that you're doing for the environment. And thank you for working with the children and teaching them. And and thank you. Thank and th- please thank Lucky for us too. So okay, we've got his page open in the book. Okay, thank you very much. Uh-huh. We'll be back uh-huh. in just a moment. Coming up. Dogs serve an important role in our military, and that is one reason we celebrate and honor them on Canine Veterans Day. Stay tuned. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com Welcome back, everyone, to the Doggy Diva Show. We are celebrating a very important day this month, and it's on Tuesday, March 13th, and it's Canine Veterans Day. And we are so honored to have with us today U.S. Navy Corpsman Joe Worley of America's Vet Dogs. Welcome, Joe. How are you? I'm doing fine. How are you? Very good, thank you. Can you just tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and about your work with Vet Dogs? Absolutely. So I was uh, in the Navy, and uh, in 2004, I ended up getting injured. I ended up losing my left leg above the knee to an IED, uh, trying to assist Marines. As a corpsman, we're, you know, we're medics. Spent a lot of time in the hospital, a lot of surgeries and things like that. You get on the other side of that, and you are 
really trying to figure out who you are and what to do. And you go from being the guy that helps everybody to the guy that needs an awful lot of help. And uh, I was looking for something to get involved with. I was on a trip and I saw this dog that was running around just being a dog, being a good dog. And, uh, and it was a facility dog for, uh, for Walter Reed and his name was Deuce. And Harvey, the guy, the dog's handler says, Deuce, come. And the dog's entire demeanor changed. I've never seen anything like that in my whole life. They're just in movies. And this dog immediately like changed demeanor and started doing all the things that the dog was trained to help with, like climbing under things, retrieval, bracing. And it was just insane. And I, I wanted to know more. I wanted to get involved. And he told me about America's Vet Dogs. And I, just, I got caught up in it. And here, here we are. 10 years later. Wow. Can you tell the listeners who may not be familiar with um, with it, can you tell them about America's Vet Dogs? Absolutely. So what America's Vet Dogs does is they train uh, service dogs for veterans and first responders. And it doesn't cost the veterans anything. And so anytime a veteran has served, and it's any veteran, any war, any age, it doesn't have to be a combat-related injury or anything like that. Just at any point that a, a, someone who served our country needs help, you can apply to America's Vet Dogs, and America's Vet Dogs will can train a dog to help mitigate a physical disability, help with things like hearing, vision, uh, seizure response, nightmare interruption, all these things that so many people deal with, these dogs are trained to, to take care of. It doesn't cost the veteran anything, and it's an incredible process, and they've been doing it for 70 years with the Guide Dog Foundation and now uh, in 2003 uh, with America's Vet Dogs as a sister company they you know created just for this and the program just gets better and better. I got my first dog in 2008. Uh, his name's Benjamin. He's amazing. He's still here. And then I got my second dog in April last year who's a yellow lab named uh, Galaxy who is just wonderful. He's sitting here curled up beside me. <laughs> and the the whole training, everything has just improved so much in the past eight years. I, did, I, I had no idea going back through that it was going to be such a completely different that they have implemented all these new things. It's amazing. The vet dog treats, you were talking about that. But they became um, involved with vet dogs. Can you tell the people, the listeners about vet dog treats and that involvement with vet dogs? So because we do this completely without any sort of of government funding or anything like that it's all donor dollars part of our funding comes from corporate sponsorships and i mean really one of the first people that jumped on board was was bill jack Uh, they're if you don't know who they are they make super premium doctors absolutely yeah and they're really good people and i've known them for years now and uh and so i think I don't think it had anything to do with my rugged good looks when they asked me to be on the. <laughs> You're on the, the cover of the treats. You're the treat guy. <laughs> I know. I have. I'm the guy with the dog that happens to be with the dog on the treat bag. <laughs> no, yeah, that's they, great. They're using that as a as a informational tool to sort of show people about America's Vet Dogs, and then also um, proceeds from that. Uh, part of that goes towards raising money for. America's vet dog, and they've they've raised an awful lot of money for us, and they're continuing to work for us, and it's just been years. It's not something that that they're doing for the purpose of of marketing. This is something that they are emotionally involved in, and they have they have been amazing. I, I love Bill Jack. Well, and what's so good about it is that every purchase that you make of these treats, it goes to America's vet dogs who train and provide the assistance to veterans and active duty personnel with disabilities at no charge. And and you so eloquently said that. And each bag of treats helps to make a difference in the lives of these American military heroes. And these people, I mean, like I said, I was a corpsman. I was a medic. I've been taking care of people. That's my whole job. And this is something that I found that I can still do that job, even though I can't run anymore. I can't, you know, do a lot of the things mm-hmm. that I used to be able to do. I can still help people. I can still. This makes a difference in people's lives that you would, couldn't imagine. I mean, this is just such a big, big deal for so many people. And not only that, dogs are so good at being a part of people's support system, even if they're not trained for that. These dogs are trained to mitigate physical disabilities, but everybody knows that dogs are really good emotionally to have around. 
Well, on that note, and I want to digress a little because of what's going on in the world right now, there were therapy dogs in Parkland with the tragedy of the shooting in Parkland to comfort the children and the families. I found that to be so moving, and it just showed the power of dogs. I mean, it's that um, emotion. It just sort of helps to calm people down and bring people together. There's a reason why people live longer when they have a dog. Absolutely. Absolutely. Beautiful. You, I, I saw that picture of all those dogs. Yes. Lined up and I, I want you to lay on the ground in front of them and just <laughs> cuddle with all of yeah. them at the same time. It's so important. And that's why it's so important what, what you're doing. Joe, where can the people go to learn more about Vet Dogs Treats and, and learn more about America's Vet Dogs? So um, you can actually go to vetdogs.org. Um, we also have a Twitter and um, a uh, Twitter and a Facebook, and you can find out about that. Bill Jack has a Facebook as well. Uh, I'm not sure about their Twitter, but um, it's yeah, they do. They have a Twitter. Yeah, yeah. But if you you go there, you can find out all sorts of things. You can find out um, ways that you can help. We're always in need of of weekend puppy raiser volunteers and stuff like that. We have a lot of our dogs boo prison programs, which is incredible. And they need people on the weekends to help socialize the animals. So say I live in the city, you know, getting a dog used to going on the subway or a train would really, really help. That's really great because I was going to ask, how can we get involved as listeners with the program? See, if you're like me, you don't, you're not super rich people that have just money laying around and you can, and we have to have money. So I'm not saying anything about that, but I am saying that volunteers are the only way that we really can function. If we had to pay everybody to do everything that we do, we would not be able to function very efficiently as a nonprofit. You, we always need volunteers. We have events going on all over the U.S. all the time, um, mostly in the northeast and uh, in the southeast. And we are branching out. Uh, we have dogs all over the U.S., but you know, our, as far as having places where we function out of, where you know, we're moving westward. We're growing. We're having a good year so far. And uh, and people can help with with donations, which, you know, are are how we work and volunteers, which are if you don't have money, we you know, we always need help with everything that we're doing. Where can the listeners go if they want to make donations, if they want to get involved? Where can they go to learn more? Well, you can go to vetdogs.org. Um, and then also the Bill Jack Dog Treats that raise money for us. They're in, in a bunch of stores. Each bag that you buy, you're totally paying it forward. So it's such a wonderful thing. And and you're right there on the front of the, with the, with a service dog. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, plus, it's something you're going to buy anyway. Yeah. I mean, most people buy dog treats anyway, and if you can have something that that also serves a purpose, it's it's kind of a no brainer. And they're yummy dog treats because we get the dog treats. So I, they're th- they're such yummy dog treats. I have to thank you. I want to thank you for your service. Number one and number two, I want to thank you for the wonderful work you're doing with America's Vet Dogs and. It it was such an honor to have you on for such a special occasion. So um, I thank you, and um, and I thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Before we close today, we'd like to add that Miss Olive and I are honored to be a part of the heartwarming book, Love Unleashed, Tales of Inspiration and the Life-Changing Power of Dogs. And we were so happy that another dog and his pet parent that was featured in the book Lucky the Turf Mutt and Chris Kaiser were with us today, as well as the book's author, Rebecca Asher Walsh. The book is available on Amazon and other book retailers. We know that you will enjoy it just as much as we do. Pet Life Radio, the number one pet radio network on the planet, joins forces with iHeartRadio to put the power of your pets in your pocket. Awesome. Download the iHeartRadio app and rock Pet Life Radio on your phone, on your tablet, on your Xbox, in your car. Pet talk, pet tunes, and fun pet times. Pet Life Radio and iHeartRadio. Positively possum. We would like to thank our guests this week. And also, as our doggy divas always say, please love your pets because they love you unconditionally. And please remember to adopt, foster, spay, neuter, and microchip. And as always, please have a great diva week, everyone.
That's all for this episode of the Doggy Diva Show. To find out more, go to our website, thedoggydiva.com. Also, find us on our Facebook page, The Doggy Diva Show, and tell your fellow dog lovers about it. Don't miss Susan Marie, Miss Olive, and the Doggy Divas right here for the next episode. See you again soon. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.